Welcome to this presentation in which we're going to cover the topic of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is a topic that we cover in chapter six. I know that says chapter five, but really mean chapter six of the textbook. And um, we have lectures posted about chapter six. And in those lectures, we do discuss many aspects of jurisdiction. But I also have a standalone class lecture that I usually teach for jurisdiction. So what I'm going to do is repeat some of the material in the tape lectures and also go on to cover the material that I cover in the face-to-face -face class. So um, some of this will be familiar to you. Some of this will not be familiar to you. Um, I'm going to, the stuff in this video, or excuse me, in this um, PowerPoint, that is fair game for the final. I'm sorry, for the midterm and also for the final. Um, but there will be other material that I will be covering that isn't on this PowerPoint. That additional material isn't going to be on the midterm. Um, but I think it's helpful to make sense of this material. So when I leave this PowerPoint, you can start saying, okay, the, the, the rest of this presentation may be interesting and helpful, but it isn't stuff that I'm going to see questions on on the midterm. So let's begin. So what is jurisdiction? This is the definition um, of jurisdiction that we're using in this class. It's the authority of a court to hear a specific case. And so this is what you're going to want to commit to, at least memory, at least be able to recognize when you're taking the midterm. Um, if you're doing Quizlet, again, this would be a good definition to include on your Quizlet list. There's lots of different types of jurisdiction, and we're going to cover several of them. We're not going to cover them all, but the two big ones are a jurisdiction over persons, which is usually called personal jurisdiction, and jurisdiction over subject matter, which is usually called subject matter jurisdiction. You might call this the, the number one and number two types of jurisdiction. There are several others, but these are probably the most important. When people talk about jurisdiction, they're usually talking about one or both of these topics. So let's first of all explore the topic of personal jurisdiction. This is the authority of a court to hear disputes that a particular person has living in a particular area. Imagine for a second that I want to sue Bob and Bob lives in Minnesota. Bob never comes to Texas, has no connections to Texas. I live in Texas and it's more convenient for me to sue Bob in Texas. But a Texas court isn't going to have jurisdiction over Bob because he, Bob doesn't have any connections to Texas. And so as a result, while I can attempt to sue Bob in Texas, what Bob will do is he will dispute that the Texas court has jurisdiction. And he's likely just jurisdiction over him, the person, and so therefore the court lacks this type of jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction. I mean, that makes sense, right? If we live in Texas and have no connections to Alaska, we shouldn't be made to go all the way to Alaska to a court to um, have, if we're sued in a particular dispute. That doesn't seem fair or reasonable. And in the United States, each state is its, has its own jurisdiction. And so if I'm talking about Texas courts, that's different than um, Massachusetts courts. It's different than Hawaiian courts. It's even different than Louisiana courts or Oklahoma courts. You might say, well, it's a lot more convenient for a person who lives in Collin County to go to Oklahoma than to go to Maine, for example. But from a legal perspective, we consider that uh, physical proximity to be irrelevant. Crossing the Red River is as big of a deal as crossing the Pacific Ocean to get to Hawaii. So we, we're going to look, when we talk about personal jurisdiction, about the ability of those courts to exercise personal jurisdiction over a particular person. Now the term person is tricky in the law. When I use the word person in everyday conversation, I'm using it as a synonym for human being. I mean a, a human being. I mean a man or a woman or a child. In the law, though, person has a broader meaning, and it includes non-humans like uh, corporations, partnerships, governmental entities. So it has a broader meaning. It wouldn't, though, mean animals. So it's a, either a human being or it's a legal entity. And so you can see that corporations is part of this analysis. Now you might say, well, 
we know if I want to sue Bob, we know where he resides. He's got a house. He's got an address. He's got a pillow somewhere that he puts his head in every night. And so we can track where he's a resident. But what does it mean for a corporation to be a resident of a particular state? Well, we look at really two things when we consider that. One is we consider where does that corporation primarily uh, do business? And in some corporations do business lots of different places. For example, my guess is that Walmart does business in all 50 states. It probably has some type of, of place. It may be a Walmart. It may be a distribution facility. It may be a Sam's um, where it's doing business in all 50 states. But maybe Bob's Mart um, might just do business in Texas. And so um, we need to look to see where it does business. Now, this is a term of art, doing business in a state. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily that you have had one transaction from that state. It requires more than that. And so for the purposes of this class, we're not going to do a deep dive into exactly what this term means, other than just the kind of straightforward meaning that it has, which is, this business is engaging in commerce in this particular state. And the idea is if a business chooses to engage in commerce in, in we'll say, Mississippi, then it has, in essence, um, consented to um, have the courts in Mississippi exercise personal jurisdiction over it. If it didn't want to, to submit to the personal jurisdiction of Mississippi courts, it shouldn't have done business there. And again, I'm saying corporations, but this could be partnerships, limited liability companies, or other type of entities. Whether we're talking about corporations or residents, we also need to consider the issue of a long arm statute. Now, let's say that Bob wants to sue me this time, and Bob is a Minnesotan, and he has no tech contacts or contacts with Texas. He wants to sue me, and he knows that I am a Texas resident. And let's say he decides, well, I'm going to sue you in Texas. I'm going to sue, Bob wants to sue Groover in Texas. Well, even though Bob doesn't have any contacts with Texas, if he as the plaintiff chooses to sue me in Texas, he is um, uh, agreeing to submit to the personal jurisdiction of that court, at least with respect to this dispute. So he can't complain later on. After all, he's the plaintiff. He gets to pick where he sues. He can't later on say, well, wait a second, Texas court. I don't want you to hear this dispute. The Texas court would say, uh, well, you're the one who picked the jurisdiction. So you can't change your mind at this point. So when we're talking about personal jurisdiction, we're only talking about the defendants. Defendants don't ever want to get sued, obviously. But there are certain places that are more convenient to be sued than less convenient to be sued. And so when that defendant is saying, hey, wait a second, I don't want to be sued here, the court sometimes listens. So going back to my example, Bob is a Minnesotan. He sues me, a Texan in Texas. I don't have an argument. I'm a resident of Texas. By choosing to live here, I have submitted to the personal jurisdiction of those courts. But let's change the facts a little bit. Let's say I'm actually an Oklahoman who regularly does business in Texas. Maybe I'm an attorney who, or let me put this way, maybe I'm a paralegal and I live in Durant, Texas, on the other side of the Red River from Texas, but I go into Denison. Uh, to work at a law firm there. So I'm engaging in commercial behavior in Texas on a regular basis. Well, my decision to accept employment in Texas is sufficient most likely to result in me having consented to the personal jurisdiction of Texas courts. And so Bob the Minnesotan can likely sue me in Texas. But it gets to be a little bit more complicated for Bob potentially because Bob can't say, truthfully that I live in Texas. So he has to use another mechanism to have the courts assert personal jurisdiction. And the mechanism he almost certainly will use will be the long arm statute that the Texas legislature has passed. As far as I know, all states have these. I would be very surprised if a state didn't. 
the way I like to think of the long arm statutes is I imagine, and this is going to date me, but it's really dating my mother more than me because she used to talk about this um, animated character called Gumby. And he was kind of green and he would really stretch his arms all kinds of ways. So I always imagine when I think about long arm statutes, I imagine that the court is kind of like Gumby. And um, the, the court stretches its um, elastic arms all the way into that distant state, grabs that corporation or grabs that individual, lifts him up and brings him plop into the state where the, that court is located. That is, in other words, Gumby's long arm is what is bringing him that, that potential defendant into the state. Now that works only if that defendant, of course, has at least sufficient minimum contacts with the state for the long arm statute to work. This is necessary to exist before the jurisdiction of the court can be exercised outside of the boundaries of the state. So you really kind of need two things. You need to have the long arm statute if it's out of the state, um, or you just rely upon the fact that the person is a resident in the state. There's another type of personal jurisdiction, which is jurisdiction over property. In civil litigation, you'll probably hear a lot more about this, but I'm not gonna talk about it right now. So that's our introduction to this first type of jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction. Let's go on and talk about the subject matter jurisdiction. So we've been talking about the people who are being sued. If you think about this like a novel, let's say we're talking about um, um, uh, a, a, a tale of two cities. Well, one of the characters in the tale of the two cities is Charles Darnay. Um, you know, and, and so that would be an example of a character. But there's also a plot with respect to uh, the tale of two cities. It's uh, about things going on in Paris and things going on in London. And so um, to have a novel, you kind of need both. You need characters, people to do stuff, and you need stuff for them to do. And so when we talk about personal jurisdiction, we're talking about the cast of characters. We're talking about subject marriage jurisdiction. We're talking about what happens in our story. So, for example, in the lawsuit, let's say Bob wants to sue me, maybe there was a car accident. Well, the subject matter of the lawsuit then would be who caused the car accident, what happened, who was injured, what degree were they injured. And very likely in that case, a person, Bob, would be suing based upon some type of tort theory of recovery. But sometimes he might be suing under a statute or a constitutional issues. And so those topics are what become the subject of the lawsuit. And so if we're suing about a federal law, then we're gonna need to think about filing in federal court. If we're suing about a state law, we're gonna probably be suing in state court. And so it becomes important to know what the subject matter of our dispute is to know which particular court we're gonna sue in. So this is largely about personal jurisdiction, it's largely about which state are we gonna sue in? Texas, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Florida, whatever. This one is more about are we gonna sue in a state court or a federal court? So you can see in our federalistic system, we really need answers to both of these questions. Because we could sue, we, maybe we know for sure it's gonna be Alabama where we're gonna sue, but we still have to decide, am I suing in an Alabama state court or an Alabama federal court? Or maybe I'm sure I'm suing in federal court, but I'm not sure whether I'm suing in Kentucky or in Alaska. And so we need answers to both of these questions. And so therefore we need to consider both of these issues. This is the way I like to think about it. We need to have personal jurisdiction. I like to think about this being a bucket full of water. And we also need subject, this should be subject matter. Sorry about that, subject matter jurisdiction. The interesting thing about jurisdiction is even though these are buckets, um, we think of them more like an on off switch. So you can't have just a little bit of subject matter jurisdiction 
or a little bit of personal jurisdiction. Either the bucket is all the way filled to the top or it's completely empty. And you can see we have the word and here. So for a court to act, it must have both personal jurisdiction over the defendant and subject matter jurisdiction over the dispute. If it just has personal, can't hear the case. If it just has subject matter, can't hear the case. This is an and situation. The really important case with respect to personal jurisdiction, that first type, our red bucket, is a Washington versus International Shoe. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this case. It is a Supreme Court case and it, it, it deals with how to interpret the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution is what is considered one of those Reconstruction Era Amendments. There's three of them. There's the 13th, 14th, and 15th. And these are um, constitutional amendments that were passed right after the Civil War. And in many cases, they were designed to address very difficult situation that African Americans were experiencing in the United States. The 14th Amendment addresses lots of different issues. It's a really long amendment. But one of the things that it addresses certainly is uh, concerns about mistreatment of African Americans and also Chinese Americans. But it, um, the, the part that we're focused on doesn't have as much to do with that. It is focused on the, about the fact that uh, about the idea of the due process of law. We're all entitled to due process of law. And in this context, what, what we're getting at is somebody in Minnesota has a right to the same due process of law as somebody in Texas. And to require that Minnesotan to travel down to Texas to have his case be heard um, may not be an exercise of due process of law. That's what the 14th, or at least that's what the, the courts were saying the 14th Amendment has to do with. At least, among other things, the 14th Amendment, again, is a very broad uh, focused amendment. Anyway, what, um, International Shoe, which is usually what people call this case, established that if a court chooses to do, excuse me, if a business chooses to do business in a particular state like Washington State, then um, it's going to have to submit itself to the to the uh, personal jurisdiction of those courts. So this was a broadening of the power of state courts to hear cases um, that affected its, its population. So uh, for example, Walmart that is based in Arkansas can't say, well, we're not based in Texas, we're based in Arkansas. So anyone who falls in a Walmart store and gets injured is gonna have to sue us in, in Arkansas that'd be a pretty big burden on people who just happen to have a slip and fall at a Walmart store. And the courts would say, no, no, haven't you ever read International Shoe? Uh, Walmart, you chose to come to Texas. You chose to open these businesses. And the 14th Amendment says that um, we can therefore exercise personal jurisdiction over you as long, of course, as we have a long arm statute that permits us to do that. So this really has to do with out-of-state corporations, typically, where we see um, the exercise of this personal jurisdiction. Now we're going to flip and talk about subject matter jurisdiction. This is the other bucket, the kind of green bucket, I guess. And we're going to talk about state versus federal. So these are the ways we get into federal court. When I was a little girl, my grandmother had an expression that she would use. She wasn't a legal professional or anything, but she would say sometimes, don't make a federal case out of it. And what she meant by that was, don't make a big deal about something that isn't a big deal. I don't know where she heard it. That may have been something from her generation, but it stuck with me. And I didn't really understand the context until I went to law school. And really what she was saying is, um, the federal courts only exercise jurisdiction if they have a very specific reason. It's hard to make a federal case. It's much easier to, to make a case in state court. And so when she was saying don't make a federal case out of it, she was unbeknownst to her saying it's much easier for a plaintiff to successfully sue in state court to get jurisdiction in a state court than it is to get jurisdiction in a federal court. These are the bases for a federal court exercising jurisdiction.
Let's start by just saying about 10% of all litigation happens in federal courts. So the, the, the default rule, the expectation everybody has when there's a dispute is, we'll get it solved in state court. That's where most of the litigation activity is. But there are some ways that you can get into federal court and we're gonna talk about those. Um, you can see this list has five. Some people separate this and actually consider this the sixth reason right here. And there's actually additional ones beyond these five or six. But um, we're just going to focus on these. The first thing is if I'm suing about a constitutional issue, I can sue in federal court. If I'm suing about a U.S. treaty, I can sue in federal court. If I'm suing the U.S. government or the U.S. government suing me, the lawsuit is going to be in federal court. If I'm the state of Texas suing the state of Alabama, or Oklahoma or whatever. One state suing another state. That is going to happen in federal court. Now these situations certainly come up sometimes and I don't want to diminish their importance because they are really important. But I'm going to be honest with you. You can practice your whole career and never see any of these situations come up. They happen, but they're not tremendously common for ordinary legal professionals to handle. The bottom two, the two in bold, though, are pretty common for legal professionals to confront. They make up most of that 10% of federal court actions. The first is what we call a federal question. And a federal question is when a federal statute is at issue. So the way I remember this is, I just replaced the word statute, or excuse me, the word question with the word statute to remember this one. So I just plop this word in. So if I'm suing about a federal statute, I can sue in federal court. Um, and then the other one is diversity jurisdiction. We're going to talk about this one for most of our time today. So I'm going to put that one aside for now. You'll see diversity jurisdiction actually has two requirements. This first one is that we have diversity. And the second one is that the amount of dispute has to be more than $75,000. None of these others have a dollar amount. A really common mistake for students to make, I'd made it myself when I was learning this stuff, was to think that the $75,000 threshold applied to all of these. Nope, just applies to diversity. I can be suing about 15 cents here in any of these other areas and the federal court's going to hear my, my particular issue, at least arguably will hear my issue. Sometimes there's a $15 or $20 threshold, but usually they will hear these issues. Um, for diversity, we need more than $75,000. So if I'm suing literally for $75,000 and zero pennies, I have not reached the threshold amount. If I'm suing for $75 and one cent, yes, I have satisfied this requirement. Before we go into more information about diversity jurisdiction, let's pause and talk about exclusive versus concurrent. I'm going to flip over to the next slide. You can see here is a picture of it. Sometimes a state has exclusive jurisdiction in a topic. This would be an example this would be family courts. Let's say I want to get a divorce. There is no divorce court that's a federal court. It's all state court. So I'm going to have to go to a state court to get that issue resolved. The state court has exclusive, meaning they're the only ones, jurisdiction over family law matters. If I want to file for bankruptcy, I'm going to have to go to federal court. Federal courts have exclusive jurisdiction in this area. Again, exclusive means only place to go to. Another way I remember this is, you know, if you're dating somebody and you're getting kind of serious, you want to be exclusive with this person. You want to be the only person that he or she is dating, right? If you're very upset if you find out that there's been some concurrent dating going on, that the other person has been playing the field and dating other people when you thought it, you had an exclusive arrangement. So concurrent is when the plaintiff can choose between different courts. Maybe the, it can be heard, the dispute can be heard in federal court, but also the dispute can be heard in state court. As a general rule, and there's some really important exceptions to this, but as a general rule, the plaintiff gets to pick. And so an example of this could be 
a tort lawsuit in which Bob the Minnesotan is suing Groover the Texan. That's a possibility where there would be concurrent jurisdiction. Bob is suing, so he gets to pick. Is he going to pick a state court or is he going to pick a federal court? We don't know. We'll have to wait and see. So that's what we mean when we talk about exclusive versus concurrent. Let's go back to this slide. You'll see in parentheses, I say whether it's an exclusive or concurrent jurisdiction. For the U.S. Constitution, the plaintiff gets to pick state or federal courts um, because both courts systems are established by the U.S. Constitution. So this is an area of concurrent jurisdiction. If I feel my constitutional rights are being violated by the state, I can sue in Texas state court or I can go to federal court. Um, but the next, the next two are exclusive. If I'm suing about a U.S. Treaty, treaty, I have to go to federal court. That's the only place they can give me relief. If I try to sue in state court, the state court judge is going to say, uh, I don't do that. You can't sue here for that. Similarly, if I'm suing the federal government, if the federal government's doing me, it has to be in federal court. Again, it has to do with supremacy clause. The federal government doesn't have to follow the mandates of state courts. So therefore, it'd be kind of a waste of time to sue the federal government in a state court. Um, the final uh, category here is also when two states are suing each other. Think about it. If Texas wants to sue the state of Oklahoma, it would be pretty unfair if Texas could sue Oklahoma in Texas's own state court. So it makes sense it has to be in a federal court. So these rules make a lot of sense. They're pretty intuitive. For the federal question, again, we're talking about a federal statute, you actually look at the language in the statute. Usually the statute will say uh, the federal courts have exclusive jurisdiction. But there are a few statutes that say that there's concurrent jurisdiction, that the plaintiff can still sue in state court. So you'd have to look to the statute to find that out. That's why we say it depends. And then diversity jurisdiction, the answer is concurrent. Even if you have both diversity, complete diversity, and you have a dispute that is more than $75,000, the plaintiff can still pick between suing in state court or federal court. Uh, there is concurrent jurisdiction. Now you may be thinking, you haven't really told us anything about this. I'm going to, I promise you. That's what we're mainly going to talk about today. But I don't want to get into the weeds until I've kind of given you the big picture version of this. Okay. So we've talked about fairly well the first two types of jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction and subject matter jurisdiction. We'll talk more about the particular type of subject matter jurisdiction called diversity jurisdiction in a little bit. So we're going to carve this out for discussion later. But we've we've pretty much I pretty much said all I want to say about personal jurisdiction and subject matter jurisdiction with the exception of this one category. So now we're going to talk about some other types of jurisdiction. We're going to talk about general jurisdiction and limited jurisdiction. A court of general jurisdiction hears virtually all of the disputes that arise in a particular geographical area. Um, so for example, in Texas, we call those courts district courts. It's also the name we call them in federal court, so that's kind of handy. A district court handles virtually all the disputes arising in a particular district. You know, the term district court suggests kind of a geographical bound. So whatever happens here, it's going to this court. And that's what we call a court of general jurisdiction. A court of limited jurisdiction is a court that specializes in a particular topic. Oftentimes these topics are things like family law, uh, criminal law, probate court, bankruptcy court, tax court, maritime court. You can see in the names of these courts that they're on a particular narrowly uh, crafted topic. Another very common court of limited jurisdiction would be small claims court or JP court, Jur Justice of the Peace Court. Again, sometimes the issue isn't so much what the topic is, but how much is in controversy. So you can see a court of general jurisdiction handles most of the disputes. You might, if you think about it, these are all the disputes in a particular geographic area. The district court's going to handle everything in here. 
the court of limited jurisdiction is going to handle just this dispute and this dispute and this dispute. It's going to carve out just a few. So the court of general jurisdiction, and if you think about this as like being Swiss cheese, it handles the cheesy part of the Swiss cheese. <laughs> and then the court of limited jurisdiction handles all the holes, the little carved out areas. There's not a lot. Those little carved out areas, those go to the court of limited jurisdiction. And you can recognize a court of limited jurisdiction because the name, the word that goes before court implies, oh, we're just doing these types of topics. We're, we're a, a bankruptcy court, we're a family court, we're a, a criminal court. So these are two additional types of jurisdiction. And again, you can hear that a court is either one or the other. So we could call this number three type and number four type. There's another way, and of course, these courts, whether it's a court of limited jurisdiction or general jurisdiction, still has to have the, both of the first two. So if it's a district court and somebody is suing in the district court, that district court has to have personal jurisdiction over the defendant and subject matter jurisdiction. If it's a probate court, same deal. It has to have jurisdiction over the person and subject matter jurisdiction, which, which would in this case obviously be probate matters. So the court always has to have both of these to hear the dispute. Now we're going to turn to number five and number six. And these are original and appellate jurisdiction. Let me just, yeah, uh, I have some examples here before we go on to that just for a second. I have examples of general limited jurisdiction right here. Again, family probate, small claims, bankruptcy tax. And you can see both um, state and federal court systems have courts of limited jurisdiction. Both, all of these are limited jurisdiction. Again, the general would be the district court. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about original and appellate. Courts of original jurisdiction are trial courts. They're the original place that the plaintiff goes, the first place that the plaintiff goes when the plaintiff files his or her lawsuit. So again, this would be a district court. In fact, it would kind of be all the courts we've talked about at this point. A court, a family law court would be a court of original jurisdiction. A probate court would be a court of original jurisdiction. A small claims court would be a court of original jurisdiction. A bankruptcy court would be a court of original jurisdiction. A tax court would be a court of original jurisdiction. A district court would be a court of original jurisdiction. Um, appellate court, as you can probably hear in the name, and you can see it ends with A-T-E, Appell 8, are courts we go to second. So after the trial, or after the trial court has released the case and somebody is appealing, you go to an appellate court. So if I am suing Bob and I decide, well, I know he's gonna appeal, whatever. even if I win, he's gonna appeal. Let's just skip to the chase. Let's go directly to the appellate court. The appellate court's gonna be like, no, we don't hear cases. Trial cases, you gotta go to the trial court first. Um, maybe you'll be back here at some point, but you can't skip that first stage. Um, and so um, you have to go to the original court of original jurisdiction first, and then and only then can you go to the appellate court. So an appellate court doesn't hear um, matters that should be resolved in a court of original jurisdiction. Similarly, a court of original jurisdiction doesn't hear appeals. So you have to know which one of these you're supposed to be hanging out in. Okay, so we've talked about six, and obviously a court of original jurisdiction, be it a court of general jurisdiction, all courts of original jurisdictions are either courts of general jurisdiction or courts of limited jurisdiction. But whichever one they are, they also have to have personal jurisdiction and subject matter jurisdiction in order to proceed. So you can see how it's not either or. You need to look at kind of at all of these levels. Uh, we have to decide, is personal jurisdiction present? Is subject matter jurisdiction present? Is this a court of general or limited jurisdiction? Is this a court of original or appellate jurisdiction? We've got to look at all of those levels, and sometimes even more, which I'm not going to get into. Um, but th that's how those categories work. 
Now let's talk about venue. You may have heard this if you've watched some detective shows of some type. A lot of times in criminal cases, maybe the criminal defendant wants to move where the trial is going to happen because he or she is concerned that the jury pool has already heard on the news a lot about the cases. And so they're, they're concerned that maybe the, the jury won't be able to be unbiased in the hearing of the case. And so we call that a um, change of venue motion. Well, that's similar to what we're going to talk about here. Um, not exactly the same, but similar to that concept. Um, but let me start by telling you a, or reminding you of a couple of, of ideas. First of all, venue is not the same as jurisdiction. It's not a new type like general or limited or original or appellate. It's separate from jurisdiction. So it's going to sound, when we talk about it, it's going to sound similar to jurisdiction, and it does have some similarities, but it is not a type of jurisdiction. It is not jurisdiction. This is what venue is. Venue is a choice between places that already have jurisdiction. So if we have, and we, I kind of gave some foretaste of this, I was saying, well, maybe the plaintiff has to choose between suing in Alabama State Court or Alabama, or Alabama Federal Court. Um, but that's, there's more than one courthouse in Alabama, I promise you. There's even more than one state court in Alabama, and there's more than one federal court in Alabama. So you have to find the right courthouse to file your lawsuit in. Now, if one court, one state court in Alabama has jurisdiction, they all do. But that doesn't mean they're all equally appropriate to hear the case. Imagine the state of Texas. Let's say I have a dispute with somebody that arises in El Paso. I live in El Paso. That person lives in El Paso. The dispute arose in El Paso. It makes a lot of sense to resolve that dispute in an El Paso court, right? I mean, that's just common sense. It would hardly seem fair for me, the plaintiff, to be able to make that poor defendant come all the way to Texarkana to hear the res res uh, to resolve the issue. I mean, that's hundreds and hundreds of miles. And so while that Texarkana court would have jurisdiction, because as we said, the, Al the El Paso court has jurisdiction, so if one court in the state has jurisdiction, all the courts have jurisdiction. But we would say that the Texarkana court is not an appropriate venue for this dispute. So it, it would have jurisdiction, but it wouldn't be appropriate for venue. So what the court has to do is decide whether um, the particular court in that state is appropriate. And there's actually a statute in every state that explains the analysis that the court needs to do. So, um, so the, there are three things that the courts look at for venue. The first is, did the dispute occur here? If the dispute occurred here, then that makes sense to go ahead and um, uh, do that. If um, the, uh, another issue is, is at least one of the defendants from this county. If either one of those are true, then that, then that county is a good place in terms of venue. Um, but if neither one is true, then usually that county won't be a good place for a venue. Sometimes it's possible that no county in a state is the place where the incident happened and none of the defendants are from that particular county. And yet it's still a place where personal and subject matter jurisdiction exists. In that situation, the plaintiff can pick any county in the state. So don't worry too much about knowing about venue. Really what I care about you knowing is this information. Um, it's a, venue is a very complicated topic. We're just kind of introducing the concept at this point. But this time I've covered everything that is in the PowerPoint slide that you need to know about jurisdiction. So the information that I'm going to give going forward, some of it's going to be a repeat of what we've already talked about but I'm going to be giving some additional information and that information is not going to be in uh, on the midterm examination. So I think it can be very helpful for you learning the information and certainly helpful for your practice, but it's less important that you know this information than um, uh, 
uh, in the information I've already covered. So let's go to um, our canvas and let me show you a document here. I'm going to go down to a chapter six module and you can see something that's called T chart for jurisdictional jurisdiction exercises. I've already pulled that up right here. I think I distributed them in class. Um, but if you don't happen to have yours, you can certainly pull up that copy that we had have on Canvas. This is a handy dandy sheet that kind of summarizes how to use a T-chart to figure out diversity situations. This category of situations right here. Remember I said this is the one we're going to spend more time talking about. These others are fairly easy peasy. I'm kind of somewhat simplifying it by saying that. But this is the one that's tricky. And so we're going to spend more time on that. Well, when I say we're going to spend more time on that, I mean we're going to use some T-charts. So you can see a T-chart is literally a T. We have a, a line up here and then a line going down. That's where it gets its name from. You may have done T-charts in accounting. You may have done them in mathematics or other courses. Uh, certainly T-charts are not unique to jurisdiction, but this is a helpful way of looking at it. Okay, so let's consider for a second that we have Bob. Um, it's not going to let me draw on this one, is it? Let's see here. Yeah, this is just a screenshot that I have. I don't actually have it so I can type on it. Let's see. So let's imagine that I write Bob here. So imagine that I write um, the name Bob here. So what I'm going to do is I am going to write Bob. Bob is suing Larry. Okay, so if you were writing on your t-chart you would put Bob right here and you'd put Larry right here because Bob is the plaintiff and Larry is the defendant. Now I'm trying to figure out whether diversity of citizenship exists, whether we meet the qualifications for this. But in order to, to get to this point, this is about subject matter, I need to also consider the issue of personal jurisdiction. Because remember, we need to have both of these buckets be full. So we're going to look at personal jurisdiction first. You can do them in either, either order. You can, some people look at subject matter jurisdiction first, but I'm going to look at personal jurisdiction first. This when we're talking about personal jurisdiction, we just care about the defendant because Bob, when, whatever, wherever he chooses to sue Larry, is going to file his lawsuit in that court. And that mere act of doing that is Bob submitting to the personal jurisdiction of the court. So we don't need to consider Bob because Bob is, is wherever he picks, that's automatically going to mean that court has personal jurisdiction over him. But Larry doesn't get a choice in this situation. So we need to think about Larry. So let's say that Bob is planning on suing Larry in the state of Texas. And let's say Larry is a Texas citizen. Well, this is easy peasy. Personal jurisdiction always exists where a person is a citizen. Now let's pause for a second. You may be thinking to yourself, citizen of Texas? Well, I mean, Larry's a citizen of the United States. What does it mean to be a citizen of Texas? I mean, we're not our own country. That is true, but under our federalistic system that we have in the United States, every citizen of the United States is a citizen of exactly one state as well. So if I'm a U.S. citizen, I have to be a citizen of one state. Could be, you know, Alaska, it could be Alabama, it could be Wyoming. Um, and I can't be a citizen of two states. So even if I own property in Oklahoma and I own property in Texas, I am just a citizen of one state. Usually the way you know what state you're a citizen of is where you live. Um, if you've just moved to a new state, then you're not immediately a citizen on your first day in the state. Uh, one way to think about it is when do you become eligible to vote in that state? 
or when do you become eligible for in-state tuition? That's usually about the time that your citizenship changes from your old state to your new state. Now that can be a complicated question, but we're going to just make it really easy and say we know that Larry is a citizen of the state of Texas, so we know for sure that he can be sued in the state of Texas. But you know what, even though Larry's a citizen of Texas and he can be sued in the state of Texas, that doesn't mean that's the only place he can be sued. Let's look at our T-chart. You can see in our T-chart, we have a place for citizenship, so we're gonna put Larry's citizenship, Texas, right here. But we're also gonna list other places that have personal jurisdiction over Larry. Remember we were talking about this before, when we were talking about the international shoe case, we were talking about how uh, corporations and individuals might have connections to states that they are not citizens or residents of. And so uh, Larry, um, his citizenship is a place of personal jurisdiction. So if we put Texas here, we're gonna put Texas here as well. But we may also add Oklahoma or Louisiana. Let's imagine, for example, that Larry is a small business owner and that he regularly visits customers in Oklahoma and Louisiana as well. He travels weekly to those locations. He spends the night, he goes to restaurants to eat, he transacts business with customers in Alabama and Louisiana. I'm sorry, <laughs> Oklahoma and Louisiana. So definitely, we'd have for his personal jurisdiction, Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, Grover, how many visits does Larry have to make for it to cross the line? Is, has, does personal jurisdiction exist in Oklahoma if Larry's just visited Oklahoma once 20 years ago? Probably not. It's a very fact-intensive analysis, and I'm not expecting you to know exactly when uh, that threshold is crossed. Um, while I'm not going to have questions that go into the minutiae about this, um, when we go through examples going forward, I'll tell you where personal jurisdiction exists. And usually the way I'll say it is something like this. Larry routinely does business in the states of Oklahoma or Louisiana. So that's my way of saying personal jurisdiction exists in the states of Oklahoma and Louisiana. You're always going to have just one state here unless the person isn't a U.S. citizen, then you'll have zero states here. And then you'll have the state of citizenship and you might have more. Some people have several more. Some people just have their state of citizenship. Then right here we have places where we don't have personal jurisdiction. You know, I don't care what, how much of a world traveler you are, there is just no way that you have, that every single state in the United States has personal jurisdiction over you if you're a human being. Walmart, yes. Exxon, probably. Um, but not a human being. No, but no human being does business in every single state enough to reach that threshold. So in our case with Larry, we would say he's a citizen of Texas, personal jurisdiction exists in Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, but we'd say all 57 other states, nah, there's no personal jurisdiction. So you don't have to list all the other states, but um, you know, the, the states that maybe are relevant to the story you might list here. So that's what we have with respect to Larry. Let me just list this here. So I'm just going to put P, J, T, X, L, A, O, K. Now we don't care about Bob in terms of personal jurisdiction because again, he's the one who's choosing his lawsuit or where he's going to file his lawsuit. But I'm going to put his citizenship anyway. And we're going to say that Bob is a citizen of Minnesota. Okay, so we've already resolved, just by looking at Larry, we've already resolved the issue of personal jurisdiction. Bob can sue Larry in any of these states based upon personal jurisdiction. Bob can sue Larry in Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. Um, Let's say that Bob is interested about seeing if he can sue Larry in federal court. So he looks at these reasons. Well, Bob isn't suing Larry about the U.S. Constitution. He's not suing Larry about a treaty. 
Larry's obviously not the federal government and neither is Bob. Obviously, Larry and Bob aren't two states. Uh, there's no federal statute at issue. So the only way Bob is going to be able to sue Larry in federal court is if this diversity jurisdiction works out. Now, when you're looking at this list, the, the plaintiff only needs to have one of these elements. So let's say Bob were suing Larry over a federal statute. Bob wouldn't even have to think about this category. This would be irrelevant. Um, so you only need one of these. But you know what? Diversity jurisdiction is the most common by far way to get into federal court. I think more than half of all federal lawsuits that are civil get into federal court based upon diversity jurisdiction. So it's a really important category. Um, and so let's assume in this case that this is the only way Bob can file his lawsuit in federal court if he can prove diversity jurisdiction. So we've already resolved the personal jurisdiction and now we're going to look at diversity. So the first thing we're going to do is, is the dispute over $75,000? If it's not, we're wasting our, Bob's wasting his time thinking about diversity because he needs to have that threshold. So let's just go ahead and check this box because Bob is suing Larry for, we'll say, $79,000, which is obviously more than $75,000. So we're good to go there. So now we're going to try to decide whether there's complete diversity of citizenship because we need both of these. We need diversity and we need it to be over $75,000. So what do we mean when we talk about diversity? Well, the best way for me to understand it is to go through examples. And so hopefully that will help. So in our example, we need to know the citizenship. So we're not looking at personal jurisdiction anymore. This section is no longer relevant. We're done with it because we've already finished our personal jurisdiction analysis. We're just gonna focus on state citizenship now. Okay, and while for personal jurisdiction, we just care about federal, I'm assuming uh, defendants. For diversity, we care about plaintiffs and defendants, but we, again, we only care about the citizenship side of things. So we know Bob is a citizen of Minnesota. Let me make this a little bigger. And we know Larry is a citizen of Texas. Well, Texas and Minnesota are clearly different states. So we have complete diversity. We've already established that personal jurisdiction exists in these states. And we've established that the amount of controversy is over 75,000 and that Larry and Bob are from different states. So we know that La Bob can sue Larry in Texas federal court under diversity, Louisiana federal court under diversity, Oklahoma federal court under diversity. We also know, going back here, that diversity is one of these concurrent areas. So Bob can also sue Larry in Texas state court and Louisiana state court and Oklahoma state court. So Bob has six different places he can sue Larry based upon the information that we have here. Um, and again, we, um, it's Bob's choice what he's gonna do. Now we're gonna mix things up though. We're gonna change our facts. We're gonna have, it's not just Bob, let's say it's a car accident case. It's not just Bob who wants to sue Larry. Also Brad wants to sue Larry. And Brad is a citizen of we'll say Arizona. And um, so Bob and Brad, let's say uh, Bob and Brad were both in the same car together. They both wanna sue Larry. So all of our analysis here is still good because for personal jurisdiction, we only care about the defendant and there is only one defendant, Larry. So we're not gonna change any of our analysis here, but for our diversity, we're gonna to have to look at it a little bit more. There's $75,000 still good, but what we need to confirm is that there's still complete diversity. 
Well, there seems to be. I mean, Minnesota is different than Texas. Arizona is different than Texas. So it looks like Bob and Brad still together can sue Larry in all six of these places. Nothing has changed. Okay. Now we're going to add oops, another defendant to this case. And we're going to make Louise the next defendant. And Louise is a citizen of Mississippi. Um, okay. Um, and we're going to say that personal jurisdiction exists for her in Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Now we're going to alter this a little bit up here. We're going to say no personal jurisdiction exists in Mississippi for Larry. And we're going to say no personal jurisdiction exists in Oklahoma for Louise. Okay, so Bob and Brad together are suing Larry and Louise. Same car accident, same transaction, just a big pile up on the road. Okay, so before we had Texas as a place for personal jurisdiction, and that still works. We have Texas here and Texas here. Again, we're just thinking about the defendant side because we're thinking about personal jurisdiction. We're also okay with Louisiana because we have Larry having personal, the courts having personal jurisdiction in Louisiana over Larry, also true for Louise. But Oklahoma only works for Larry. Oklahoma does not work for Louise, so we're going to have to get rid of the Oklahoma ones. Now you might be thinking, well, but we can add Louis Mississippi. That's okay. Well, no, we can't add Mississippi because Mississippi is good for Louise, but it's not good for Larry. Okay? So now we've found all the places where personal jurisdiction exists, Texas and Louisiana. But what we haven't decided is, do we still have complete diversity? Because this is looking at personal jurisdiction. Now we're going to look at citizenship. So obviously Minnesota is different than Texas. Minnesota is different than Mississippi. Arizona is different than Texas. Arizona is different than Mississippi. So it looks like we still have complete uh, diversity. And of course, our mountain controversy is still $79,000. So it looks like that Bob and Brad can pick between suing Larry and Louise in Texas federal court, in Louisiana federal court, in Texas state court, or in Louisiana state court. Let's add another wrinkle to this dispute though. Now we're going to add Brenda. Brenda also wants to sue. And Brenda is a Arizonan. Uh, so Bob, Brad, and Brenda in the same lawsuit want to sue Larry and Louise. Well, the state analysis remains the same because, again, we haven't added any more defendants. So we're still good with Texas and Louisiana because both Larry and Louise have Texas and Louisiana as places in which they have done business. Okay, but now we're looking to go, gosh, we have Arizona here and here. Does that defeat diversity? Does that mean we no longer have complete diversity? No, it's not. That's not what it means. Um, it's okay for a state to repeat in the plaintiff's column. So because Minnesota is a different state than Texas, and Minnesota is a different state than Mississippi, we're okay with Bob. We're okay with Brad because Arizona is a different state than Texas, and Arizona is a different state than Mississippi. Similarly, we're okay with Brenda because Arizona is a different state than Texas, and a different state than Mississippi. It's okay that Bob and Bren, excuse me, Brad and Brenda are from the same state. We still have complete diversity, so Bob, Brad, and Brenda together can sue in Texas federal court, Louisiana federal court, Texas state court, and Alabama, excuse me, Miss, <laughs> Louisiana state court. Apologize for that. Let's add another wrinkle to it. 
and we're going to say Lori, that they also want to sue Lori. And Lori is a citizen of Texas. So Bob, Brad, and Brenda want to sue Larry, Louise, and Lori. Um, and personal jurisdiction exists for Lori in Texas and in New Mexico and in Mississippi and in Oklahoma. Okay. Um, but it does not exist for Lori in Louisiana. The amount in controversy is still $75,000. Well, we can see that because Louisiana is not on Lori's list, we're going to have to make Louisiana go away up here. Fortunately, we still have Texas. Texas is on all three states list. Louisiana isn't on Lori's list. Oklahoma isn't on Louise's list. And Mississippi isn't on Larry's list. Just one defendant can cause the state to be tossed off the list. So now I'm going to make Louisiana go from our list. And so we've completed our personal jurisdiction analysis. Now what we're focused on is that diversity analysis. We, th we have over $75,000 in controversy, but do we still have complete diversity? Well, let's look and see. Minnesota is a different state than Texas. Minnesota is a different state than Mississippi. Minnesota is a different state than Texas. So we're okay there. Arizona is a different state than Texas. Arizona is a different state than Mississippi. Arizona is a different state than Texas. We're okay there. Arizona for Brenda is a different state than Larry's Texas. Arizona for Brenda is a different state than Louise's Mississippi. And Arizona is a different state than Lori's Texas. So yes, we still do have complete diversity. It's okay that a state repeats more than once in the defendant side. So that doesn't defeat diversity. So at this point, Bob, Brad, and Brenda can sue Larry, Louise, and Lori in Texas federal court or Texas state court. Let's add one more wrinkle. Let's say that Bob, Brad, and Brenda um, will add Bonnie to our list. Oops, yeah, the Bonnie. Bonnie is a citizen of Mississippi. So Bob, Brad, Brenda, and Bonnie want to sue Larry, Louise, and Lori. Our personal jurisdiction analysis doesn't change, so we're still looking just at Texas because, again, we only look for defendants for personal jurisdiction, our first bucket. Let me just show you again. We first, I always do personal jurisdiction first. We look at that first bucket. Now we're going to go to our subject matter jurisdiction bucket, and again, the one that applies to us is going to be that diversity jurisdiction bucket. Okay, so. Um, now we're going to decide, well, do we still, we, we have over $75,000, but do we still have uh, complete diversity? Well, unfortunately we don't because Minnesota is different than Texas, Mississippi, and Texas. Arizona is different than Texas, Mississippi, and Texas. Arizona is different than Texas, Mississippi, and Texas. Mississippi is different than Texas, but Mississippi isn't different than Mississippi. And so this is a problem. We could have a hundred plaintiffs and a hundred defendants. And if there's a single occurrence of one state appearing on one side and it also appearing on the other side, that sinks diversity. So this tells us that we don't have a federal basis. We don't have this category. And so we don't have any basis to be in federal court. That doesn't mean we can't sue, but we just can't sue in federal court. So I'm going to make this one go away. The only place the Bob, Brad, Brenda, and Bonnie can sue Larry, Louise, and Lori is in Texas State Court. And I could add somebody to the other side and have the same result. I'm not going to go through it. I will add Linda here. And Linda is from, uh, she's a citizen of Minnesota. The same result, though. Let's make um, Bonnie go away. Well, we'll make her a citizen of Massachusetts now. So because Linda's Minnesota 
and Bob's Minnesota are the same state, then that also defeats diversity, and so therefore we're stuck in state court, okay? And of course, we'd have to do the analysis of personal jurisdiction as well with Linda. We're just going to say that personal jurisdiction exists in the state of Minnesota. Of course, it's always going to exist in the home state and in Texas and we'll say in New Mexico. Um, and so that means that the only state that we have overlapping is going to be, we'll just add, We'll say no Minnesota up here for Larry. Okay, and so the only state in which personal jurisdiction exists is in Texas, and we don't have a basis to be in federal court, so we're going to say Texas state. Let me add one more, and of course, all this data you can be putting in on this sheet by adding the various information. Now we're going to add, oops. A corporation. So Bob, Brad, Brenda, Bonnie wants to sue Larry, Louise, Lori, and Linda, and we're going to say Ford Motor Company. So how do we decide if a corporation citizenship? Well, even though it's not a citizen in the same sense that you and I might be, it actually has two citizenships. So unlike human beings that have one, we, can, we treat a corporation as if it has two. And the first cor, cor, uh, citizenship is, is its state of incorporation. I'm not 100% sure where Ford Motor Company is incorporated, but oftentimes they are incorporated in the state of Delaware. So I'm going to assume that's the case. The other citizenship that I am sure about with Ford is that its principal place of business, PPB, its headquarters, in other words, is in um, Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, right? So we know it is citizens for this example of, Minis of Michigan and Delaware. Either one of these two state citizenships can thwart our diversity. Now in this example it doesn't because we don't have Delaware anywhere on any of these lists and we don't have Michigan. I'm going to change Lori's citizenship to Michigan though. And I'm going to add <coughs> Michigan to this list. I'm going to say that Louise has no connections to Michigan. So, um, so now um, we have Ford, Ford Murder Company shares a state citizenship with another defendant. But it's the same thing we talked about before. It's okay if a state shows up on more, more than once on one side here. But if I change Bonnie's citizenship to Michigan, at that moment, diversity is defeated because we have Michigan here and we have Michigan here. Or it could be that Bonnie is from Delaware. That would also cause a problem because we'd have Delaware here and Delaware here. Now again, just a refresher, if um, the plaintiffs had one of these bases to be in federal court, we wouldn't worry about diversity at all. We just need one of these to be true. Um, now of course, in the case of Ford, personal jurisdiction is going to exist everywhere because probably every state in the United States has a Ford dealership. So I'm going to say all 50. But it could be a smaller corporation might just have a few states and so we would have to consider that in our analysis. So I'm going to make this back to, we'll change this to California. So now we're back to complete diversity and so now I'm going to be able to make Texas federal court also here because you can see Minnesota doesn't appear. Actually, it does right here. Let me switch this. We'll make this um, Alabama. Minnesota doesn't appear here. Arizona doesn't appear here. California doesn't appear here. So we have complete diversity. Our amount in controversy is over $75,000. So we satisfy the diversity requirements. So we can sue in federal court. 
but because diversity is a concurrent type of jurisdiction, we can also do in state court. So that's it, our analysis. You may, your head may be hurting at this point. You may be thinking, oh my gosh, there's so much going on there. It is a complex subject. Um, my, what I like to tell people after this lecture is, if your head isn't spinning a little bit, if you feel like you completely understand this, you weren't paying attention. Nobody gets this the first time they hear it. It's one of the reasons I, I present this in this class, so that maybe you get 30 or 40 percent of it. And then at some later point, you'll get 20 or 30 more percent of it. It's one of these ideas that you have to be, or at least I think, you have to be exposed to a few times for everything to kind of gel together, so to speak. So if you're sitting there thinking, uh, I'm not sure about this, that's good because it means you were paying attention. You may want to go ahead and watch this a second time in the hopes that maybe 10% more will fall into place. But it's probably not all going to click really, really neatly. Let's spend some time on these jurisdictional questions just to see if we can get some of the pieces to fall into place. You'll find these jurisdictional questions in two places. One place is in chapter six, it's the next to bottom item, jurisdiction sample questions. It's also in the midterm review, it says first item right here. We're not going to do all the jurisdictional questions, I'm just going to go through some. And you can do these in your own time if you would like. The neat thing about these is that what I have here in bold is a true false question. And so what you can do is you can um, cover these up and then go through and test yourself to see if you know what the answer is. And then once you read it and think, oh, I think I know what the answer is, then you can reveal the answer by changing the ink back to black and see if you were correct. And not only if you're correct, but if your reasoning was right on whether it was correct or not. So I'm going to go through these just to make it even maybe a little bit more clear, but play around with these a little bit. These questions up until the Luis one are fair game for the midterm. I'm not going to ask you any scenario-based questions, or at least none, no scenario-based questions as complicated as this. So once you get to here, um, you don't have to do them. I might have a scenario-based question, but it's not one that requires you to do T-charts. Okay, so let's read this first one. A court must have both subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction over the defendant in order to decide a case. That is true. Think back to our buckets. We've got to have both. And it's just over the defendant we have to have personal jurisdiction. But we do need to have personal jurisdiction over the defendant. So that is true. Let's go to the next one. Go ahead and reveal this. Subject matter jurisdiction is concerned with deciding the correct state in which to file the lawsuit. False. This is personal jurisdiction. Personal jurisdiction answers the question of which state should I file in? Should I file in Alabama or Ohio or Kentucky? Subject matter jurisdiction answers the question, should I file in state court or federal court? You have to answer both questions because if I pick federal court, I have to pick a federal court in a particular state. If I know what the state is, say, Colorado, I need to know, well, am I going to go to the federal courthouse in Colorado or the state courthouse in Colorado? So if I switch this to personal, it becomes true, but as written, it's a false statement. So I'm going to, this is false as written. Let's look at the next one. Personal jurisdiction can be waived by the defendant. And this is true. I should probably add here true. True. So let's say the defendant doesn't have any connections with Hawaii, but you know what? He's always wanted to go to Hawaii. And as soon as he gets sued, he thinks to himself, this is my chance. You know, when life gets you lemons, make lemonade. So he doesn't have to object. Maybe this is the perfect thing for him. Or more likely, he forgets to object. And if he doesn't object by, by the, the, the date that he needs to object, then he's stuck going to the court that he doesn't want to. 
So yes, a defendant who isn't paying attention can absolutely overlook whatever concerns there are about personal jurisdictions. And once that deadline is passed, he can't ever successfully raise it. That's what's different is, per, uh, that differs from subject matter jurisdiction. Subject matter jurisdiction can never be waived. So let's say I sue my husband for divorce but I file my dispute in bankruptcy court. And the bankruptcy judge says, okay, I've always wanted to handle a divorce, so let's go for it. And my husband's like, sure, why not? Sounds good. And so we're all in agreement that this bankruptcy judge can hear this case. But you know what? He really can't. He doesn't have the authority. So let's say after the bankruptcy judge hears the case, it goes on appeal, my, um, I may ask, kind of now ex-husband, I don't know what you'd call him, he files an appeal and he says, oh, um, I don't like what happened in that, in that court. But he never mentioned subject matter jurisdiction. You know what? The appellate court on its own can raise the issue. Now, does this ever happen in the real world? Of course not. Nobody's going to miss something like subject matter jurisdiction. But in theory, the court never had any authority. And even if the parties choose to ignore that lack of subject matter jurisdiction, it's still a problem at any point in the litigation. Okay, so personal jurisdiction can be waived. Subject matter jurisdiction cannot be waived. So subject matter jurisdiction is about the plot of the lawsuit. What statute is relevant to the fact pattern? personal jurisdiction is about the cast of characters. Um, who are the players? Who, who um, got injured? Who is responsible for their injury? Um, so personal jurisdiction is about the characters. If we were to place the word venue with characters, it would be a true statement. Venue is the third type of jurisdiction. False. We know that Venue is not any type of jurisdiction. It is true that you're going to decide venue after you've done your subject matter analysis and personal jurisdiction analysis. Because remember, venue is a choice between places that have jurisdiction. So you obviously have to know who has jurisdiction to, to figure that out. So you're, whenever you're deciding venue, you're always going to look at subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction first decide, okay, I'm going with Texas state courts, for example, or, you know, Illinois state courts, and then you pick the venue within that state that's appropriate. So the part of the question that is right here is, oops, sorry, is yes, it is decided after. So this part is correct, um, but this part is false. It's not a type of jurisdiction. Venue establishes which courts in a particular state are appropriate to hear the case. That is true. By filing the lawsuit in a particular court, the plaintiff is waiving any objection to subject matter jurisdiction or personal jurisdiction. Well, it is true that the plaintiff is waiving any objection to personal jurisdiction. Well, we've already established you can't ever waive this. There's no way, no matter how much plaintiff wants to waive it, can't be waived. So this is the part that makes the statement false. The default rule is that a matter should be filed in a state court of general jurisdiction. Let me explain by what I mean by that. If you are a plaintiff, if, if, you, if your law firm handles plaintiff matters, what I mean by this is your usual expectation is I'm going to sue in state court. I'm going to sue in, in a district court in the state of Texas. That's what you expect to be the case. There's going to be times where that expectation doesn't work out, where through some uh, surprising developments, you end up in federal court or you end up in a court of limited jurisdiction. But most of the activity is going to be in a state court of general jurisdiction. That's kind of your working assumption when you handle litigation. And this is true. So that's what the default rule is. Courts of limited jurisdiction hear cases related to a particular topics, such as probate or bankruptcy. That is true. A federal court has subject matter jurisdiction over a matter if a federal question is raised. This is true. Sometimes people get confused and think, oh, well, it, the court has to also have diversity. Nope. 
These are all ors. If the federal court has this, or this, or this, or this, it has jurisdiction. It can have more than one, but it only needs one. A federal question is a technical type of pleading done by the plaintiff in which he or she alleges she was improperly interrogated by agents of the federal government. False. Federal question, you just replace the word question with the word statute. A federal question arises when a plaintiff presents a claim arising under a federal law. And this is just the definition of federal question. You can replace statute or law with question here and that becomes a true statement. Another means for a federal question, for a federal court to have subject matter jurisdiction is there to com be complete diversity of citizenship in a matter. And this is true. Now, I like to, because sometimes people struggle with true false questions and so I like to talk about this one because sometimes people think, oh no, no, it's false because you don't say anything about needing it needing to be over $75,000. So I explain why it's still true here. The reason that someone might have answered false, might be tempted to answer false, is in addition to their need to be complete diversity, the amount in controversy must be greater than $75,000. The second requirement is necessary, but it's part of the complete diversity of citizenship analysis. So there's two parts to the complete diversity of citizenship. You do the citizenship analysis and you find that there is at least 75,000 or actually one penny more than 75,000. So that's, uh, sometimes we, we overthink these questions, I guess you could say, and, and trick ourselves up. Diversity of citizenship requires that at least one, I apologize for the typo, one person or defendant is a citizen of a country other than the US. It is true that uh, citizenship can be international citizenship and you can do the same analysis that we just did and put France or China or um, you know Sierra Leone or whatever country um, and use that same analysis. Um, but you certainly don't have to have a person who is a foreign citizen. Okay, the diversity of citizenship requirement means that no plaintiff can share the same citizenship with any other plaintiff or defendant. This is true. I mean, false. If we remove these words, it becomes true. The diversity of citizenship requirement means that no plaintiff can share the same citizenship with any defendant. The plaintiff can share it with another plaintiff, just like the defendant can share it with another defendant. For d diversity, jurisdiction, the amount in controversy must be over $75,000. That is true. I'm going to flag something here with this one. This is statutory. This amount can go up. It may well go up next week. Um, when I started practicing, the amount was $50,000. And it's been $75,000 for a really long time. Honestly, it should have already gone up. And so uh, don't get the $75,000 stuck in your head as like, oh, that must be from the Constitution. No, it's not. It's just a statute. It can and will likely go up. Personal jurisdiction concerns the level of contact that the defendant has had in the particular state where the lawsuit is filed. That is true. Again, we care about the defendant, not the plaintiff, because the plaintiff picks where he or she's going to file the lawsuit. The 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution guarantees due process of law. And again, this is important for lots of reasons, but for our context, it has to do with personal jurisdiction. In order for a court to have personal jurisdiction over defendant, he must also have sufficient context with the state so that it is so that the requirements of due process are met. That was kind of a weird, I apologize, I had some words left in that. And that is true. Subject matter jurisdiction is primarily concerned with whether the case should be filed in federal or state court. That is true. Personal jurisdiction is primarily concerned with the particular state in which the case should be filed. 
and that is also true. I'm not going to go through these scenarios. I do them in class, but um, I don't want to overwhelm everyone with the information. Um, again, focus on the information in the PowerPoint. If some of that confuses you, those are going to make great questions to bring to class um, when we meet. But if what was confusing was the T-chart stuff, I'm going to suggest you come to my office hours to talk about that in more detail. I don't want us to get kind of overwhelmed and, and it's easy to get things confused and I don't want the rest of the class to kind of uh, feel uncertain about what they thought they already knew because we've thrown some more things at, at you. So um, if it's about what we covered in the PowerPoint or the multiple tr or the, the true false thing that we just did those are great questions for class if you have questions about t charts please bring them to my office hours and i will be delighted to answer them i thank you so much for your attention and i hope that you have a wonderful day take care